All right, hey everyone. So yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, technology here at MPC and kind of some of the roles that we've got. Uh, quickly though, a bit about me. Everyone loves talking about themselves. Uh, my name is Rob. I'm currently the head of new technology uh, here in London. I've been at the company for about 10 years, just over 10 years now, and uh, had a variety of roles since joining, always part of software or one of the software divisions. Um, my focus has bounced all over the place in terms of playing with different areas of the VFX pipeline, uh, sometimes very involved in shows, sometimes quite um, or focused on longer term central software development. Probably my most uh, glamorous recent role was on uh, Disney's The Jungle Book. I was the R&D supervisor, uh, which was pretty cool. Earned me uh, my own movie credit there, single line, which is really nice. Uh, and unfortunately, I didn't personally win any of the awards, but I got to uh, hold a whole bunch of them. Uh, I'm still hunting down the BAFTA. I haven't had a chance to touch that one yet. But on the left, we've got our HPA award. On the right, we've got one of our VES awards. And then in the middle, of course, is the Oscar, which is very heavy. Uh, these things are, yeah, would, would do some serious damage if you ever dropped them. So a, a little bit about my journey, how I got to MPC and the software team here. Uh, I started uh, by studying computer engineering back in Canada. Uh, you'll notice that despite being here in London, I don't have a British accent. I'm Canadian born and bred. Uh, so I studied computer engineering, University of Waterloo. Uh, finished up uh, many, many moons ago, 2003. Uh, one of the interesting things about my uh, study there is that it allowed me the chance to take some breaks and do internships. Uh, the program was such that you spent four months in school and then four months in an industrial placement. And this kind of ping-ponged back and forth over the course of a five-year period. So two of the more notable places that I ended up was first Amazon, uh, which seemingly has nothing to do with visual effects. Other than by lucky happenstance, uh, my supervisor there was the ex-CTO of Industrial Light and Magic, uh, one of our competitors, and certainly at the time, the, the biggest visual effects facility in the world. Uh, so that was fantastic, um, both being exposed to exciting new technology at Amazon, but also being able to just kind of pick this guy's brain about, hey, how was Jurassic Park done? How were some of the Star Wars sequels done? And learned a whole pile about visual effects. and really opened my eyes at that point to the possibility that actually the stuff that I was studying in school and my personal passion for the movie industry weren't at odds, that there was definitely an application of my studies to uh, the movie industry. Autodesk is one of our key vendors. Uh, they provide a whole big software suite, in particular the Maya product that we and other visual effects facilities use every single day. Uh, so being able to work in that company was very eye-opening into what it takes to actually write visual effects software. And it also gave me kind of a, a peek into who some of the clients were, who are these visual effects facilities, what do they do. This was all based in uh, Toronto. The Amazon placement was in Seattle, but Autodesk was in Toronto. And after a little bit of time there at Autodesk, I also joined them just after graduating in university. Uh, I made it clear that it was great working on this technology that we were selling, but I really want to get closer to the movie making process. I want to get closer to the clients. And about two, three hundred meters down the road was a visual effects facility called Core, Core Digital Pictures. And they were under a period of rapid growth and expansion and looking for people with software development backgrounds. So lucky timing, I joined them and uh, I was there for about two, three and a half years. And it was great. I really enjoyed the time there. But after about three years there, I wanted to try something slightly different. I wanted to go to a place that was working on larger scale Hollywood blockbusters. And the choice was either at that point in time, either Los Angeles or London. And I'd never been to London before, so I thought it would be a great chance for a new adventure. And so I joined NBC uh, to work on, at the time, Prince Caspian, and since then, literally dozens of films. So uh, a bit about London and NBC here in London. Some of the most recent projects that we've been working on are the recent Pirates of the Caribbean film. Uh, we're just finishing up Transformers, and then hot on the heels of that is Blade Runner. As we finish those, we're transitioning into some new exciting projects for Disney. Uh, so The Lion King and Dumbo uh, are going to be doing remake versions of those. Much more modern in terms of being very photorealistic in look. Um, unfortunately, not a lot more I can say at this point, but it's going to be awesome. 
Uh, but London is just one of NBC's many film sites. Uh, we've got a strong Canadian presence now with Vancouver and Montreal facilities. We've got a large uh, facility out in Bangalore. And then most recently, our film department has expanded into Los Angeles. And each of these five sites has a software team here. So software development for NBC is very much a global effort, much the way that the movie making process is very much a global effort. Uh, the films that I highlighted there are just kind of a very small segment of NBC's overall film work. If we think about the other film sites, I didn't have time to go and hunt down the movie posters for all of these, but here's just kind of a short list of some of the other film projects that we're working on right now. So, I mean, I think it's pretty safe to say that really NBC is working on the biggest Hollywood blockbusters that there are right now. And London will contribute to at least some of these, but definitely the big focus for London is going to be those kind of two big Disney uh, movies that I mentioned earlier. Now, really I'm here to talk about technology, not to talk about the kind of filmmaking process. And actually it's going to get a little bit more specific than that. I'm going to start by talking about some of the technology roles that actually I honestly have very little insight into. Uh, there are kind of a whole bunch of support roles. There are technology, um, technical uh, development roles within artist teams. So we will have animation TDs, effects TDs, tech anim TDs. We have people who support our rendering through our render TA group. We have our production operations, data operations, imaging engineers, system engineers, and of course IT. So these are all roles that are definitely grounded in technology and have technical requirements. But really thinking back to my specific role as head of new technologies, that forms one of the pillars in an overall group that we call software technology. And it's really formed of kind of three main groups. So new technology, which I lead, is in many ways sort of a technology incubation group. Uh, we're very much trying to figure out what does a visual effects facility look like five years from now? What are the kind of technical components that go into that? What is the artist's day-to-day -day workflow? And try to experiment a little bit with prototyping exciting new ideas, playing with new technologies that are coming out either in academia or in our vendors, and trying to develop uh, proof of concepts in-house as well. What's going to give MBC that technical competitive edge over all of our competitors in the years to come? We share a close partnership with the other two pillars of our software technology group. On the bottom left, I've put down core engineering. And they're very much focusing on building the technology infrastructure, providing the tools that a lot of our other development groups use. They're creating build systems. They're building bridges to our cloud platform. They're very much uh, kind of building the building blocks that artists aren't necessarily uh, consciously aware that they're using, but indirectly benefit them greatly. Uh, the kind of foundation of our asset management system lies within that group as well. Now, jointly, core engineering and new technologies really feed into what we call our CG tools group. And these are the guys who are really building the flagship technology. They're building the tools that are very, very artist-facing, things that our artists are consciously aware of that they're using, the kinds of things that tend to end up in our press releases, in our online articles, the things that we submit for technical awards. Uh, we actually won an award for one of them, which I'll talk about in uh, a little bit. So within the software technology group, we have these kinds of job titles. If you hop onto our online recruitment site, you may see some of these listed. So we have software engineers, we have core engineers, we have embedded TDs who kind of straddle the fence between a more traditional TD who sits within an artist team and a software developer. We have shader writers who are focusing on ensuring that our materials are as beautiful and physically representative as possible. We have render TDs who are focusing on ensuring kind of that our renders are as optimized as possible, trying to make sure that we're taking as best advantage of our render farm as possible, I'm not kind of wasting this compute resource that we've got. We have a very, very large render farm, but of course, it, like any resource, it's never big enough, so we need to make sure that we're making best use of it. Uh, we're looking for user interface and kind of user experience specialists. We have a very, very long uh, and rich portfolio of software development. I mentioned that I've been at NBC for about 10 years, but actually our software development probably goes back closer to 15, 20 years. So we've got kind of a, a strong legacy in writing our own technology here. And one of the things that we really want to focus on is ensuring that there is consistency to it, that the artist experience is consistent and homogenous as possible. And of course, wrangling kind of 20 years worth of software development and a very, very large software development group. Globally, we are 
well over 100, um, going to be pushing 200 soon. We need a lot of management. Uh, we need a lot of coordination and we need a lot of, kind of project management to ensure that there is that kind of nice global rhythm and coherency to our efforts, to our vision and just our day-to-day -day operations. Now, everything we do is really in service of the artists. MPC is not a software development uh, company in the sense that we don't sell our software development. This is not what makes MPC money. What makes MPC money is the beautiful pictures that we produce. Software is there to service that. It's there to help our artists in that effort. And we always start as a foundation with uh, a rich portfolio of third-party technologies. We always try to see what can we buy first. And then our software development effort is focusing on making those tools even greater than you would get out of the box. So just focusing on a few of the technologies that we uh, like to purchase. Some of our best partnerships are with Autodesk for Maya, uh, Foundry for Mari, uh, Side Effect for Houdini, back to Foundry for Katana. All of our rendering right now goes through RenderMan, offered by Pixar, and then we finish off with uh, Foundry's Nuke. So this is kind of our baseline. These are the out of the box products that we start with. And then from there, we try to build a rich portfolio of technology on top of it. This is accomplished using three main programming languages. The bulk of our software development takes place in either C++, uh, particularly for things that are more algorithmic and where performance is highly beneficial and required. Uh, in Python, we have a huge amount of Python, particularly when we start thinking about data interchange, pipeline development, uh, kind of the way that data gets from develop uh, from artist A to artist B, flowing between, say, animation and modeling and effects, rigging, all of those different groups. And we also have a rich legacy of Lua-based development. So between these three languages, I think we're probably covering 70, 80 percent of our software stack. Now, in addition to that, we are also building a lot of web-based platforms, a lot of web-based technologies. So there's a whole suite there. Again, many, many icons that would be involved here, HTML, JavaScript, CSS, all of those kind of web technologies we're also embracing with open arms. Now, I mentioned that we're building a whole bunch of flagship tools. These are some of the ones that, if you've ever read press releases about NBC technology, you might have seen mentioned. So Muggins and Giggle provide the framework and foundation for a lot of the CG technology that we like to write. Um, they define even just very basic and mundane things like what do we think a color looks like from a technical standpoint, all the way down to some slightly more algorithmic things in terms of how do we reduce mesh complexity. And on top of that is what we've really built a lot of our CG tools on. Fertility is our first system that artists work with. Pappy and Kali are our effects toolkits. Pappy does rigid body simulation and some basic destruction. And Kali is more recently about kind of bending and breaking. It's really about that deformation. If you look at the way that, say, a tree shatters, it kind of first bends a little bit, and then it uh, kind of explodes into a cloud of um, splinters and twigs and stuff like that. Kelly, actually, we were awarded with a SciTech award a couple of years back, uh, which was very exciting. Uh, it was a quite new piece of technology for us, and it was really great to see that the industry was impressed with our accomplishment. And similarly, we've seen uh, products like this showing up either in VFX houses or now in third-party offerings. Uh, Houdini has something that's quite similar now. Alice is one of our oldest uh, tools, and it's how we do crowd simulation at MBC. This goes all the way back to Kingdom of Heaven and Troy, back in kind of 2000, 2001 era. Uh, we had kind of been awarded those shows, and the big challenge for those shows was, hey, we need to do enormous armies, 100,000 uh, people on both sides fighting it out. And there were no commercial solutions at the time, so it really was upon our, us to write um, an amazing crowd simulation software. And it's still alive today. It's obviously undergone many iterations since then, but it still provides the backbone of all of the crowd simulation that we do here at NBC. Volumetrics is uh, unimaginatively named uh, to represent the technologies that we've got to do volumetric type rendering. Clouds, smoke, dust, fire, those kinds of things. Um, some of our more recent developments have been actually focusing around Fabric Engine as a new platform. So Thalia is a way that we do modular rigging in Fabric Engine. Machi is around some city layout. Um, this is actually showing up in Alien Covenant, which has just hit the screens a couple weeks back. Thinking a little bit more about some of our infrastructural software, Ripple represents the way that we get uh, things onto the farm for rendering or for other batch processing. 
Amanda is our distributed compute system. We actually defer a lot of our computation expense to other machines, either central machines or now, of course, we're starting to play around with uh, cloud-based compute. Early days there, but still very exciting. Packaging and Tessa are our asset management system. This also goes back many, many years before I got here and kind of represents the way that we assetize all of the work that our many, many artists are doing. If we think about uh, the Jungle Book as just a random example, we had 800 artists scattered around the world working on this. So using email to communicate obviously doesn't work at that scale. Uh, just putting files in random directories and kind of tapping your buddy on the shoulder doesn't work. You really need kind of a detailed and kind of well-oiled machine to allow this data to flow between sites, between groups, between artists. And it also facilitates a huge amount of automation. One of the things that we really enjoy is being able to make requests back to very early uh, departments, maybe go back to modeling and say, you know what, the fingernail on this character needs to be a little bit longer. And a modeling artist can go and make that arguably very small change, but then there's a huge kind of ripple of dependencies that needs to happen as a result of that. And by setting things up in our asset management system, a lot of those can happen automatically. Animation can be reapplied to that new model. The simulation of, say, the fur, if this is a furry creature, or the muscle jiggle, the fat jiggle, can be automatically rerun. The effects can be rerun. We can generate new renders. We can generate new composites. Uh, there are actually full chain tasks that we can make requests back to the first department and just get a new render out at the end. No other artist needs to be involved. And that's fantastic. And then Pronto is kind of the start of our investment into web-based technologies. It's very much about our scheduling and the way that we organize these enormous productions across literally hundreds of artists. So you can see here, it's just an enormous software stack that we've built up and there are probably two or three times this list in terms of other technologies that we've either written or are currently writing as we look ahead to the future. So talking about the future, where is, where is it all going? Um, as kind of head of new technologies, it's meant to be my remit to try and answer that question. Um, and honestly, I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out, trying to guess. Uh, one of the things that is definitely quite obvious is that the future of filmmaking is changing. People are always looking for exciting new ways to tell their story. Uh, it's always been the case that directors want to show the audience something they've never seen before. And sometimes that's been a new story, uh, but many ways, uh, many times it's also just a new way to tell the story. So one of the things that we've been looking at recently is kind of non-traditional um, filmmaking, but all, then also kind of uh, film presentation. So Fast and Furious Supercharged was our first foray into doing theme park rides. And then uh, partnering with the Alien Covenant crew, we also did a VR piece, a kind of an experiential piece called In Utero, where you can actually put on a VR headset and you're presented with a 3D video, 360 degree video. Uh, you can kind of look around as, well, I, I won't give it away because any of you get a chance to uh, experience it, but it's part of the Alien universe. So you can probably guess and uh, yeah, as, as the poster indicates, it's bloody. We're also looking at a lot of game engines and real-time technologies to facilitate uh, better previs, better virtual production, and just other kind of processes in the filmmaking industry. Over the last, I would say five-ish years, there's definitely been a convergence of filmmaking and game technology. And I think it's now getting to the point where we can actually start to do some pretty productive and exciting things with it. Uh, I mentioned already that we're looking at Fabric Engine, but then of course, complementing that, we need uh, really strong game engines. So we're quite excited about both the direction of Unity and Unreal Engine. Uh, this is one of our software developers up in our kind of motion capture suites doing some virtual reality work uh, using some custom tools. Uh, I'd hope to actually show you the full picture here, but uh, I had to censor it at the last second. This is some upcoming work that's not yet meant for public consumption. Um, again, a shame I can't show it. It is really, really exciting. Uh, what I can mention is that he is doing some set layout here. So he's actually creating a full environment in the virtual uh, world. Uh, in the VR set, he is part of that environment and he's going and sculpting the elements that are there, putting down fine details. It's a very immersive and compelling way to work uh, rather than just being presented with a flat screen to actually go into the world and pick up, say, a rock and carry it over a meter and put it down on the ground somewhere else. It's 
it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool where it's all going. And we definitely want more people to kind of come and help us build the technology that's going to make it possible. So uh, yeah, as I've mentioned before, and obviously the fact that we're having this webinar, we're hiring. We're hiring around the world, and we're certainly hiring here in London, where I am. So if we think a little bit about uh, what are the characteristics of an applicant uh, that I personally look for, it's uh, quite a variety of things, uh, some of which are very visually uh, visual effects linked, and some of which are more kind of software engineering based in a more kind of generic way. We like to have a, a balanced background, let's say. We want people who come from a background of very, very strong software development. We want people who come from a very almost artistic background, I would say. And when we've got that healthy mix, then we kind of have a nice understanding of the art and the science that actually helps provide the best technology for our studio. Uh, I mentioned that we've got hundreds of artists, so we're generating enormous amounts of data. So we need some experience in analytics to try and figure out you know, what is all this stuff that we're generating? What do we do about it? Are we efficient? Could we be better? API design certainly goes hand in hand with software engineering backgrounds. Um, on the slightly more abstract uh, sense, we want people who understand strong maths, strong physics. Uh, when we start thinking more specifically about rendering light transport, it is very interesting. I mentioned that increasingly we're moving some of our technology to be more web-based. So thinking about some of the more, more modern web tools, it's, it, it blows my mind when I hop online these days and I'm presented with just the interactive power of modern websites. It's, it's amazing what can be done now. Uh, that couldn't be done even like three, four years ago. I just finished talking about real-time rendering, so that's obviously something that we are excited to get people with that kind of background, be it games or otherwise. Data processing kind of goes a little bit back, to, uh, a little bit back to analytics, um, but also forward to just how do we process our geometries? We are incredibly good at presenting and creating just enormous amounts of detail for our clients. Uh, sometimes to the point where we actually set ourselves up with a later problem in the pipeline that suddenly our renderer struggles to handle the billions or trillions of polygons. And then it comes back to, okay, well, how do we provide a more optimized representation of all of that to the renderer or to other processes in our visual effects platform? And I mentioned at the very beginning that uh, user interface and user experience, which is kind of the homogenation of our uh, tools is something that we are very keen to uh, pursue further. So we hope that you as an audience can kind of latch on to some of this and say, you know what, actually that, that sounds like me. That's, that's exactly my background. That's exactly the kind of stuff that gets me excited. And we hope that as a result, you'll hop online. Uh, we have a very nice and short website, easy to remember, but I'll leave it up here on the screen for a nice long time so you can write it down and commit it to memory. But yeah, hop online and apply. Uh, tell us about yourselves and let's see if we can find a, a way to move forwards. So I guess that's just kind of a, a taster overview of technology, in particular software technology here at MPC. Um, I'm going to bounce out of the slideshow. We can actually see kind of the uh, recording again. Yeah, and we'll, uh, pop back and go back to so we'll stop that. And so cool. So yeah, I mean, thank you. Well, that was, I mean, yeah, it was really, really important for me. That was really informative. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's lots of things that, you know, uh, yeah, it was really kind of interesting about that. So, I mean, I, I guess we, we can start sort of looking at, at some questions now, maybe. There should be a, a box for you guys to, to, to ask some questions. And uh, as I said, if, if we don't manage to get to you, then, then do feel free to um, contact us afterwards. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, we, we've got one here, so bring that up. Um, Stuff here. So, do you use Flex Bison, creating layers or phrases or um, down from scratch? Uh, that's, that's 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 the first question. Um, yeah. So we'll go through these one by a time. Yeah. So, um, so in terms of kind of compiler technologies, we are mostly working with third-party provided programming languages. Um, that said, yes, we do still need to, sorry, this is going to get very technical, so I hope I don't alienate some of the audience here. This is pretty hardcore questions that have uh, been asked here, which, which is great. I love talking about this stuff. Um, but yeah, like that, hopefully for the rest of you, I don't kind of lose you. Uh, so the question about Flex and Bison, yes, we use them to a degree. Uh, we don't do a huge amount of custom programming language development here. Uh, but sometimes to write tools to help us understand or debug third-party languages, uh, we do need to parse those scripts, and we will rely on FlexBison or other uh, software kind of parsers and lexers. In my own personal time, yes, I've definitely used them as well to 
kind of play with toy programming languages. It's, it's good fun. Everyone should do that. If you ever study computer science, you should write your own programming language. Cool. So next one, how often do you write um, CUDA kernels for your own numerical solutions instead of using the C++ libraries such as Labs from NVIDIA? There's a lot of words I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thankfully, I can still answer these <laughs> ones. So, so yeah, CUDA, and I'll, I'll expand that a little bit more to include OpenCL, and basically just the idea of uh, GPU compute or uh, GPU technologies. Um, we definitely use it when it's available out of third-party technology in terms of in-house development. I'd say it's still mostly experimental. Uh, we use it indirectly. Fabric Engine makes it quite easy for us to write code using their KL programming language, which can be then executed on either CPU or GPU. You can think about it a little bit like OpenCL, where it can kind of target multiple backends. Um, we've written a bit of CUDA code to support uh, a GPU-based path tracer we did a couple of years back. Um, but beyond that, we still focus predominantly on CPU-based development. Uh, it's easier to debug. We find the performance to be more uh, predictable. And also, if we think about the distribution of our hardware footprint at MPC, we have more kind of CPUs than we have GPUs. Uh, I think it's still interesting to see where GPU-based programming and computation is going moving forwards. Um, CUDA seems to be the stronger platform than OpenCL, uh, but it's not something that we're kind of directly linking to right now. Uh, I think we'll kind of always keep that level. Well, maybe not always, but for the foreseeable future, we'll keep a level of indirection, be it uh, Fabric Engine's Kale or something else. And the last question for, for this one is, do you use other than NVIDIA GPU solutions which require OpenCL instead of CUDA, for, for example? Oh, um, do you use other? Again, it, it depends on what's provided indirectly. Uh, so if we think about Houdini, for example, they've got some OpenCL-based uh, technology that we'll leverage. Uh, but in terms of direct uh, programming, we don't really write for either OpenCL or CUDA. Uh, we've certainly got lots of stuff in kind of experimental mode. Like I've got I don't know, several hundreds of thousand lines of CUDA code or OpenCL code when I was playing around with fluid simulation engines. Um, but yeah, our, our production code that we write in-house tends to be either C++, Python, Lua, or some other bridging language like Kale from Fabric Engine. Cool. All right. Well, I mean, keep the, the questions coming in, guys. Um, I, I, mean, I was going to ask Rob, actually, because I mean, as, as, as you know, my role here, I didn't explain earlier, guys, so I'm a talent manager, so I, I'm the one that was going out and, and hiring a lot of these people. And you know, I, I've spoken to a few techie people in the past and been to a few conferences and conventions and you know you speak to people from you know more visual backgrounds and, 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 and graphics backgrounds but obviously you speak to a lot of people who don't come from those kind of backgrounds you know and obviously like yourself you started off in a non-visual based you know company and is, is that something you, know, you as a hiring manager do, do you specifically look for that kind of background or you do you look at people from all kinds of walks of life you know when it comes to hiring people yeah i mean we really try to keep a balanced portfolio of our staff here at uh, NBC, and particularly in the software team. Uh, we've got people who came from banking, we've got people who came from games, we've got people who came from visual effects, uh, even from a more artistic side. I think there's something very healthy in terms of having multiple perspectives on how to solve problems. I mean, visual effects is very much about solving new problems, both for the artists and the technologists involved. For me. Um, and kind of having multiple perspectives can only help. So when I look at candidates, it really is about what is their kind of proven background in solving problems, I guess is the simplest way I can put it. Uh, and just being able to show me that they've been faced with tough situations and managed to come up with some creative way to deliver a solution. Uh, and in the context that in which they did it, it's almost secondary. Now, they need to have at least some understanding as to what we do here at MPC. So a lot of people, even if they did come from a banking background, have been kind of self-teaching themselves about visual effects. Maybe they've been reading articles online. Maybe they've been downloading kind of personal evaluation copies of some of the software they mentioned. Uh, you can get kind of trial versions of Maya, Houdini, RenderMan. Like all of these um, companies have made it fairly easy for people to play with their, tech, uh, with their software at home. So I highly encourage you, if you're thinking about a job in visual effects, 
try it. There are a million and one tutorials, so you don't have to kind of get worried about like, oh, where do I even begin? Um, the companies have, thankfully, and I thank them, uh, made it very easy for people to get started. Cool. Okay, awesome. Well, we've got a question here from, from Gustavo who's asking about what's MPC's relation with, with academia and, and, and research. I, I guess that means in, in terms of do we do academic research and, and things like that, or what is our relationship with the kind of the world of, world of academia through our software? Yeah, I mean, we're trying every kind of partnership we can think of. Um, we've seen great things that emerge from that. So if I think about what we're doing right now, uh, we've been taking on some master's students. So in kind of the January timeframe, we took some master's students. Over the summer, we take some master's students. Uh, we're currently hosting two PhD candidates. So they're actually doing their PhD work here within MPC, uh, which is pretty cool. They've already done a couple of publications. There was one at Eurographics about, I think, last month. And we'll be showing some more stuff at SIGGRAPH. Uh, yes, if any of you guys are going to be at SIGGRAPH, NPC is definitely going to be there. Look out for us. We're going to be very present. Um, and in addition to that, we're trying to find kind of more collaborative ways of working with longer-term academic research. So there's kind of two different streams there. One is that our parent company, Technicolor, has a strong in-house uh, R&I lab, research and innovation lab, which we try to work with. But then also we just work with other European and international universities. Uh, we just submitted uh, a research proposal with Bournemouth. We're hoping to get some funding for some interesting work there. Um, don't want to talk about too much more just yet. Um, and we submitted kind of past research proposals as well. So yeah, we're, we're definitely interested in collaborating both with individual researchers, uh, but more so also with just kind of research labs and building up kind of the longer term research. Um, uh, kind of a longer term partnership and collaboration where we can actually jointly define kind of what should be the focus. Like what's, what's the five-year vision for visual effects and computer graphics and how do we steer academic research and then how's academic research kind of give MPC early access to what that technology is going to look like. Cool, okay. Um, what, what would you say, I mean, obviously you, you've been with MPC for a while and worked on, you, you had itself dozens of, of different projects and Helped to develop dozens of different sort of technologies. I mean, what would you say was, if you could pick one out that was most technically challenging in terms of a film or a particular project or whatever it might be, something that really kind of had you tearing your hair out? Yeah. Oh boy. Um, I mean, I mean, they all do to some degree yeah. because they, like I said, every every movie is about showing the audience something they've never seen before, and it is a whole new suite of tools. I mean, it's it's never easy. We we're always kind of struggling and being pushed and being challenged and, and it's always rewarding when we get it out and done. I, I think probably though, I mean, maybe it's the easiest answer, but I think that actually it's the last two shows that I did that have been the most interesting and most challenging. So that's The Jungle Book where I was the overall R&D supervisor and the challenge there was just the sheer enormity of it. I mean, it was by far the biggest project NBC had ever done. Um, and if you've ever seen any of kind of the making of stuff, probably 90, 95% of every single frame is computer generated. I mean, it is almost an animated film. Uh, and just the sheer scale of what we had to accomplish there in terms of being fully photorealistic jungles, fully, fully, fully photorealistic animals who are talking. Um, it, was, it, it was an awesome challenge. And kind of the technology we had to build to support that was amazing. The project before that, uh, Fast and Furious Supercharged, the theme park ride, was tremendously uh, interesting in that it was a non-film project. Like this was the first one that wasn't going to be shown on a flat screen in front of the audience. The experience for the audience in a theme park ride, they were going to be surrounded by this enormous U-shaped horseshoe screen effectively. Uh, it was kind of like a VR experience, but without the goggles. And that threw up a whole bunch of technical challenges, uh, both in terms of how do we produce that image but also how do artists work in that context? How do we preview it? How do we give our artists uh, kind of a, a decent indication as to what is the audience experience going to be like? And that was, that was pretty amazing. Um, I actually got to go out to Los Angeles to see kind of an early physical build of the screen. They'd actually built a full-size replica of the screen in an, aerop in an airplane hangar. And you needed an airplane hangar because that's how big the screen was. I think it's still, at certainly at the time, maybe it's still this, the world's largest single piece construction screen, basically 400 feet long, uh, unwrapped. And it was, yeah, pretty, pretty awesome, pretty <laughs> epic. Cool. So I mean, we've mentioned that obviously we're hiring and, and we are obviously hiring at the moment with obviously the projects that, that Rob's mentioned with 
Lion King with Dumbo, you know, and that's just obviously just here in London. We've got Montreal, we've got Bangalore that are both um, growing as well from a software perspective. So, you know, these guys on here, if, if they are thinking of applying, if they are keen to come and join MPC, is, is there a particular time you think would be good for them to apply? Is it now? Is it... It's well, always down the line. It's always. It's always. Yeah. I, I think we're, we're we're always looking for people. I mean, the the specific characteristics of the people we're looking for is in constant flux. Um, I mean, it depends on who we land. One day we may be looking for user interface specialist. As soon as we find that, we're going to be switching our focus to looking for something else. Uh, the best thing to do is really go on to uh, npc.jobs and just kind of see what the job postings are. We always try to have at least a few kind of general catch-all job postings up there so that people can apply and. Sometimes we just get inspired by who applies. Uh, sometimes we just see a background that wasn't necessarily something we thought was a gaping hole in our team, but we realized, like, actually, you know what? It would be really awesome to bring that kind of guy on the team. So we're, I think we're always looking. So apply now. <laughs> cool. And I mean, when these guys are applying as well, which is a question I, I get asked quite often when, when I'm out at roadshows and um, what should they, they be applying with? I guess it does vary depending on what role they're applying for, but when we're hiring artists, it's quite straightforward. They have a CV, they have a showreel, you know, and obviously when you're applying for a technology role, you don't necessarily have a showreel or portfolio to, 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 to display. So, I mean, what would you like to see from these guys that, if, if, if they're applying? Yeah, I, I mean, a showreel or a demo reel is, it, it's pretty low on the list, quite honestly, for me. Uh, I know some people submit it and I always watch it, um, I usually don't get a lot from that, quite honestly. Uh, we will want to look at code that these guys have written. So if you have any public code on GitHub or a similar uh, service, please include the link to that so we can look at it. Um, I fully appreciate that sometimes it's difficult to get code up, either because there are IP issues with your current employer or you just don't have time in your personal life. Uh, I've got a young kid, so I certainly don't have time to write code at home. Um, I've got other things to worry about. Uh, and, and that's perfectly fine too. I mean, if you don't have code to show us, we'll find other ways to give you that opportunity. We've got lots of programming challenges lined up that allow you to very comfortably and at a nice slow pace kind of write some code on demand and show us what you're capable of. But if you already have it, that's definitely something that I would be looking at. Cool. And, and do we have, uh, is there any testing involved when people apply for jobs or anything like that? Yeah, we, we certainly try to do some amount of technical screening. And again, if there's already existing code that we can look at, that testing period can be shorter. Um, if there's nothing and we're starting from scratch, then yeah, we'll, we'll certainly go into greater depth in terms of just seeing how well do you understand things like C++, Python, Lua. Uh, if it's on your CV, we're going to ask you to effectively to prove it. Uh, if you say you know it, yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna make you prove it effectively. Cool. Um, I, last question, and then we, we might start sort of rounding it down, guys. Um, for for anyone that is, I suppose, wanting to to get involved, and maybe they're looking at some of what you're saying, saying, "Well, I know that, but I don't don't know that," you know, and and, and they're concerned about maybe not having um, the full gamut of of, of skills. I mean. Um, does NPC offer any kind of training? Do, do we try and upskill people so they can kind of become the best version of themselves they can be? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been here for 10 years and I have I definitely didn't know a quarter of what I know now when I joined, but NPC still took me on at the time and I've, it's been a constant learning experience for me. I, I think this is actually one of the really great things about NPC is just the flexibility in the path that your career can take. Uh, we've had people move around the world, uh, so international travel, which is, I know, kind of very exciting to a lot of people, less so to me, honestly, um, is something that BC offers. Also, just within sites, people move around a lot. Uh, some people will start within an artist team because they really like that tight production link. And maybe after a while, they want to improve their software engineering skills, so they join a more central software role. Other people go the other way. They start in a more central software engineering role, and after a while, they actually want to get closer to the actual production of the picture, and they'll actually go and sit beside artists. So people are constantly moving around, and part of that is also just constant growth, learning new skills. Uh, we have a lot of training material online um, for, uh, produced both for kind of our new starters, but also kind of the growth of our sites. I mean, when I joined NBC, it was a much smaller company, and it was all here in London. It was much easier for people to just tap each other on the shoulder and learn from their peers. Now that we're spread around the world, we're more formal in that. And it's actually fantastic, the catalog of training material that we've built up. 
So yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't say don't worry if you're not an expert in everything I've listed. Um, if you have some familiarity in some of what I've listed, that's a, that's a good start. Uh, yeah. Let's let's see that you've got a good aptitude to learn, and we'll train you. We'll teach you the rest. Cool. I guess I will just do this one one more here, maybe. So, uh, what kind of job roles are there for uh, Python or PySci uh, developers? Yeah, so Python definitely provides the uh, backbone of most of our asset management and our pipeline. Uh, so anything that's related to the way that we are moving data around the facility, Python is definitely the language of choice. Uh, when it comes to more of the kind of CG technology development in terms of really artist-facing tools, things like our first system or our instruction system, uh, C++ suddenly becomes much more important. But if Python is the only programming language you know, yes, we still are interested in hearing from you. There are definitely roles where Python is the only language you would be using. Uh, so a strong background in there, and particularly in PySci, where we start talking about user interface and user experience, mm -hmm. that's a key component of it. Awesome. Well, um, I hope that answered your question, Max. And um, I think I think we'll wrap it up there today, guys. So thanks a lot, Rob. Oh, my um, pleasure. I know I learned a lot. I hope you guys learned a lot as well. Um, as I said uh, multiple times now, if you didn't get to answer your question or if anything comes up afterwards that you're like, ah, oh, we really wish I answered that, then you can uh, contact us at um, talent at mpc.jobs. Uh, just put whatever questions you've got in there and someone from the uh, talent team will, will either answer it themselves, themselves or they'll get someone else in the in the technology teams to, to answer it for you and then hopefully that will offer any clarity um, you're looking for. As we've said multiple times, we're hiring, you know, and I think Rob's made it clear that there's never necessarily a best time to apply. So if, if you're keen and you're interested in what we've said today excites you, then, you know, get on the job boards uh, or get, get on our website and apply. And um, again, I say to a lot of people, we might not have a job for you now, um, but six months, 10 months, a year down the line, that can all change. Um, so it is an industry of change. So I think it's a good idea to, if you're keen and if you're interested in what we're doing, then, then definitely uh, get, get out there and, and apply. Um, any, any final thoughts, Rob? No, hope to see some of you soon here, I guess. Cool, awesome. Thanks guys. And uh, yeah, hopefully see you soon. All right.